uh, we're going to have a look at one person in particular today and I want you to be stirred because this, you know, is one of the people I refer to quite often. He is uh, one of my greatest heroes and so this is going to be very easy for me to share because he has literally changed my life even after several hundred years. Um, you're going to see the influence of this man easily fitting into the category of somebody who has literally changed the world. Now last session we looked at a man that too few people have heard of but I hopefully showed you that he has changed the world even today. His name was uh, Count uh, Nicholas uh, Ludwig Zinzendorf and he changed the world and he set in place the, the foundations for even the life that we're going to look at now. He lived in the early 1700s in Germany uh, and he literally changed the world. Even today the influence of Zinzendorf is still felt and most people wouldn't even know who this man was. And I believe God wants to raise up a generation today who will literally change the world. Who will change the world. We no longer live on the back side of the earth. From right where we are today we can touch the world and we can literally change the world. And we need to have our minds stretched and challenged to see how people in the past have done it without the aids, without the technology, without the assistance that we have today. Man, we have got so much at our disposal. We, we have uh, so little to excuse ourselves for not making a difference in this world. This week, I went to a conference where one of the speakers said he was walking through the streets of London and God spoke to him and said, in what generation has a city ever been one totally to Christ? In what generation has a city been so one over to Christ that it has changed the flavor of a nation? And this man <clears throat> said to God, I don't know. And to my absolute astonishment and horror, proceeded on to say it's never happened. And I sat there dumbfounded as I thought, you... What's the nice word for dummy? Someone give me a nice word for dummy. You silly person. London. You were there, mate. Don't you get it? Why did God ask you that question? Because you were there. There was a city that was so touched for the cause of Christ that it did capture the attention of the entire city and literally change the nation. It happened. And it happened between the years of 1800 to 1820. It happened. And I want to prove it to you. And I want to show you the price that was paid to make it happen. Now what categorizes somebody as a person who can be attributed with the description someone who has changed the world? I believe there's two things needed. Firstly, they literally changed the course of international history. They changed the course of international history. Number two, the impact of their lives goes beyond their own generation. The impact of their lives goes way beyond their generation. And the person we're going to look at today clearly, easily fits into those two categories. Now what else do we notice about people who have changed the world? And there have been several people that have changed the world. From a very early age, they have a sense of destiny. They have a sense that they were born for a purpose. That they are not just here to fill in the gaps between the cradle and the grave. They have a clear sense of destiny. That they were born for a purpose. That they were almost born for greatness. People who change the world almost universally are born with this sense. I'm going to be great. Now, we as Christians struggle with people who think and feel that way because we confuse confidence with arrogance. But I believe God has called people here to greatness, to literally change the world. Secondly, they are prepared to make great sacrifices for their vision. And thirdly, they live bigger than average lives which inspire multitudes. Now 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26 is a great foundation for looking at this. It says this, 
For you see your calling, brothers, that not many were wise men according to the flesh, are called not many mighty and not many noble. So God doesn't always take the kings and the queens and the governors and the princes and the presidents and prime ministers of this world to change this world. And we saw in Luke chapter 3 verse 1 where Dr. Luke begins to outline the great world political leaders of that day. There we have Caesar Augustus. There we have um, uh, Philip of Idumea. Uh, there we have uh, the Tetrarch of, of that area. Then we have Pontius Pilate mentioned, the great political leaders of that day. And he, he sets the backdrop and then says this, And the word of the Lord came to John in the wilderness. Not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty according to the standards of this world, the word of God says. That's who God can use. I believe this man was one of the greatest men that have ever set foot on the planet. I am a huge, huge fan of this man. His name is William Wilberforce. He was born August 24, 1759. He was born into a wealthy merchant family in Hull, a seaport town in northern England. Now, Wilberforce not only changed the laws of England, but he changed the hearts of the nation. He literally changed hearts and changed minds. In the book dedicated to him, written by John Pollock, one of the best books on Wilberforce, he subtitles it, God's Statesman. He was somebody who knew how to work with people. He knew how to bring peace to situations. He knew how to bring people together. He knew how to get things done. He was an incredible giant of a man, although he was only just over five feet tall and very, very sickly, as we'll talk about in just a moment, the price he paid. Now, he literally influenced world leaders. He influenced prime ministers and kings all through Europe and eventually across into the, what became the United States of America. Now, he established over 70 different societies and helped to personally fund each one of them. An amazing effort. Now, these societies include things like the Bible Society. They include things like the Society for the Protection of Cruelty Against Animals, the RSPCA. They include things like the Society for the Promotion of Useful Knowledge. They include the Society for the Promotion of Godly Morals and Good Manners and all sorts of societies, about 70 of them that William Wilberforce set up, many of them missionary organisations. He had a heart for the world. Now, he was destined for greatness at a young age. At the age of nine, William Wilberforce's father died. And his mother put him into care with his uncle, William, also named William, of St. James Place in London. Now, his aunt and uncle, Uncle William and his, and his aunt, were what, we would, what were referred to in, in those days as enthusiasts. That was the word given to people who were Methodists before they were Methodists. They were called enthusiasts. Why were they called enthusiasts? Because they took their Christianity seriously. They were enthusiastic about Christ. They were enthusiastic about praying, enthusiastic about reading God's word, hearing God's word and sharing Christ with people. They were called enthusiasts and it wasn't a compliment. It was a derogatory term. Said, oh, they're just enthusiastic, like loopy. <laughs> Stay away from those enthusiasts. Well, William Wilberforce was raised by two enthusiasts. And the church where they attended was frequently visited by such preachers as John Wesley, John Newton, and others. In fact, at the age of nine... William Wilberforce sat at the feet of John Newton absolutely enthralled. John Newton was the man who wrote Amazing Grace. John Newton was the former sea captain who 
used to transport slaves from Sierra Leone back to England, who then, uh, part of uh, his, his journey was in, in a storm. He thought he was going to die and he cried out to God and God heard his prayer and saved his life. And that forms a part of the inspiration for the song Amazing Grace through many dangers, toils and snares as a sea captain. And he literally did. I have already come. But it's your grace that will lead me home. Now that meant something to this man, John Newton. And he was wonderfully converted, wonderfully saved. And John Newton uh, then realised that he should get into ministry. And uh, he, was, uh, he did not have a university education, so the Anglican Church would not ordain him. Except an aristocrat, the Earl of someone or other, sponsored him. And uh, I think that means they paid a lot of money to a bishop. And a, we don't call it a bribe, we call it a donation. And they did eventually ordain John Newton. And he was ordained into the Anglican church and put into the backwater church, a place called Olney, a little rural church where he couldn't bother anybody and do any harm. But within a few years, that church was absolutely packed. John Newton went on to write over 300 hymns that are still being sung today, and his life transformed the nation, literally. But one of the lives he touched was William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce sat at the feet of John Newton and was greatly influenced by him. This is what he later said of John Newton. I revered him as a parent when I was a child. And I'll show you why that's important in just a moment. At the age of 17, Willie Milberforce, being from the upper class, the upper class society of England, could have any education he wanted. And so he was sent to St John's College in Cambridge, where, to his own admission, he did everything but study. He played cards, he drank, he smoked, he did everything you do when you go to university, except, listen to me, don't you dare do any of that stuff when you go to university. That's what they did back then, but you're, Christian kids, you set, the, you set the example. Now, he did all that, and later on he wrote how deeply he regretted his wasted opportunities at Cambridge. But it was during his time at Cambridge that he formed friendships with people like William Pitt, who went on to become England's youngest Prime Minister. Now, we need to understand, as we look back, that the Bible tells us to look back. It tells us to look back at the lives that have been lived as an example for Christ. It tells us to remember their lives, to remember what they've done, learn from their lives and apply it into our own. Deuteronomy 32 verse 7 says this, Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations, ask your father and he will show you, your elders and they will tell you. I have an insatiable hunger for history. I want to know about what happened in the past. Because those who fail to learn the lessons of the past will make the same mistakes in the present. We've got to get this right. Here is one window that I believe God has opened up for us to understand that a society such as it was at the time of William Wilberforce can be changed. And if that society can be changed, so can ours. Now... William Wilberforce entered into politics at the age of 21. That was the earliest you were allowed to enter politics. He entered in 1780. And he did his first term, four-year term, and then in, just into his second term, he had a dramatic conversion to Christ. The conversion to Christ happened after he took a trip with a good friend in a carriage across France because his health was... Uh, always a battle for him and he thought that the Mediterranean air would, would help and the, the, the warmer French climate would help. So they went for a, a holiday through France in a, in a uh, horse and carriage and his friend said to him, his friend who was an enthusiast, said, would you like to read a book with me? And so they read a book and the book that they read was a description of what it was really like to be a Christian. And as they both read this book, 
together, William Wilberforce was converted and gave his life to Christ. Now, it was such a dramatic conversion. He stopped doing the things that he was doing. He stopped drinking. He stopped gambling. He was always a churchgoer, but not a Christian. In 1786, his heart was now so stirred that being a Christian meant, should he even stay in politics? So in 1786, he went to his father in the faith. He went to see John Newton, who was by this stage transferred to a church in Buckinghamshire in London, and went to John Newton and said to John Newton, I've just given my life to Christ. I don't know if I can honour Christ and be a politician. Now, why was he thinking that? Because it was an established fact that politicians were all corrupt. It wasn't just a reputation they had. It was a fact. They really did rip off the public purse. It really was. Pigs in the snout trough or whatever. They, they ripped off the country blind. And he knew it. Everyone knew it. And he said, how can I be a Christian with good conscience and stay in parliament? How can I do it? Christian Politician, the two words can't go together. And John Newton said, maybe you can make a difference. Maybe God has called you to make the difference. And maybe you're here today and God's called you to make the difference. You see, at the time, there were no other Christians in Parliament. By the time Willie Milberforce finished his 40-year political career, Christians were the majority in Parliament. And he made the difference. So he went back into Parliament at the advice of John Newton to serve where you were saved. And so, his heart being stirred, he began to realise that Christianity is not just about what happens in four walls on a Sunday. Christianity is about honouring God. It's about honouring God. And listen, let's just digress here for a moment. I am completely bewildered at Christians who think that our God doesn't want everybody to honour him. You've got to understand me here. There are certain things that dishonour God. There are certain things that honour God. And sometimes I hear Christians say, well, we can't put our standards on the world because, well, they live by different standards, so we can't expect them to honour God. What? Where did you get that? Who told you that there are people who are excused from honouring God? Where did you get that thinking? I've heard, I, I heard to my absolute horror, on ABC Talkback Radio one morning, a minister whose denomination shall remain nameless for their own sake. And he said, well, you know, there are many Christians who oppose certain laws that the government's trying to bring in, but I don't think we can put our standards on the world. He's here in Jesus' name. Listen, it's not our standards. It's God's standards, and it's not about what offends us. It's what about honours him. That's the issue here. And William Wilberforce took that seriously. And he began to see that, that people were not treated as you would expect Christians to treat people. And he said in Parliament, how dare we call ourselves a Christian nation when we treat people like this? And the first people he saw were criminals. You know, back in those days, they're, they're, you could be charged by, the, by uh, the government, the police, and just locked up and not even told why you were being locked up. The king could imprison anybody at whim. No charges. And Willie Wilberforce said, that's not right. And he established what we now take for granted, except if you live in Guantanamo Bay. It's called habeas corpus. The body of law. In other words, there's got to be evidence. There's got to be some reason for a criminal to be locked up. Well, he tried to get that through Parliament and he lost. He was absolutely discouraged. He, he couldn't believe it. He lost. But you know what? He never gave up. Sometime after that, 
1987, he, uh, 19, sorry, 1787, he established the Proclamation Society. In 1787, he then realised that criminals weren't the only ones who were being badly done by in England, so were slaves. And it's in 19, uh, 1787 that he took up the cause of abolitionists. Now, for the next 30 years, William Wilberforce campaigned to abolish the slave trade, not only in England, but in America and France as well. He sought to honour God in every aspect of life, both political and private. To William Wilberforce, there is no such thing as a private life. To William Wilberforce, it was just life. And I suggest to us as well that we should not say, yeah, well, that's my private life. You've got nothing to do with that. That's like saying to God, you can have me on a Sunday, but from a Monday to a Saturday, don't, don't you dare tell me what to do. That is absurd. God wants all of our life. We need to see all people honouring God with all of their lives. That's what Willie Milforce did. He strove for that. He wrote a book because he realised that it wasn't just about changing laws. He had to change hearts and minds. He was a prolific writer. He wrote a book called, how's this for a catchy title, Richard Nielsen? A Practical View of the Prevailing Religious System of Professed Christians. <laughs> Richard and I were talking about a trendy title for one of my books that I'm about to publish, but I don't think that's it. Well, anyway, he, he sunk a lot of money into this. And he went to the publisher and the publisher said, this will be the ruin of you, Mr. Wilberforce. He said, oh, well, let's be ruined for Jesus. Publish it. Well, within two weeks, they were completely sold out and it went through umpteen dozen reprints. And it literally began to change the thinking of England. See, what did he do? He said, God can have you on a Monday. You can live for God on a Tuesday. Jesus can walk with you on a Wednesday. Everything you do, whether it be in the bedroom or the kitchen or the lounge room, you can have God in your life. A practical view of Christianity. And he began to change the way people thought and felt. You see, the 1700s were characterised by rampant promiscuity. Rampant promiscuity. For those that have seen the BBC series that's that has been made called Charles II, you know that that was a decadent time. That was a time where there was just rampant immorality. Kings and noblemen and so on were openly homosexual. There were, there were homosexual prostitutes all over England. Children were used and abused. They were sent up chimneys, down chimneys, burnt alive. Children were nothing. That's why one of the societies Wilberforce set up was the Society for the Protection of Children and he set up another one for women as well. You see, he had a very, very practical view that Christianity should affect every aspect of life. Now, there was a man who just six days before he died, his name was John Wesley, with the last vestige of strength that he had sat up in his bed and wrote his final letter. John Wesley, with all the strength he could muster after some time in prayer, felt God move him to write a letter to William Wilberforce. If my memory serves me correctly, the letter goes something like this. Dear brother in Christ, if God had not raised you up for this task, then surely demons and devils will prevail. But if God has raised you up, as it seems he has, then who can stand against God as he uses you as his instrument? You can do it. Keep going. The last letter John Wesley ever wrote. Six days after writing that, he died. And William Wilberforce treasured that letter, and there's a copy of that letter today preserved in a museum. Now, during the time of John Wesley, thousands and thousands of people had been awakened to faith in Christ right across England. 
thousands and thousands of people. But, you know, at the end of the 40-year preaching revival, from 1740 to 1780 or thereabouts, church attendance had largely been unmoved. If there were 150,000 Anglicans at the start of the Wesley revival, about 1780 or so when, when the revival uh, ended, there, well, there was about the same number, about 150,000 Anglicans or thereabouts. But you know, something happened between 1780 and 1820. It's absolutely staggering because by 1820 there were over 1 million Anglicans. It's not just the Anglicans. The same was true for Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Baptists. Their numbers grew, not just a little bit, but the graph goes like this, during the lifetime of William Wilberforce. Yet he wasn't a preacher. He wasn't a revivalist. He was simply a man trying to honour God and convinced that others should also honour him. He paid a great price to see his vision fulfilled. You know, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, Paul wrote this, We work hard and we suffer much in order that people will believe the truth. You know, I think the more influence you want to have, the more you have to be prepared to pay the price. For our hope is in the living God, who is the saviour of all people and particularly of those who believe. Let me tell you the price that William Wilberforce paid. Today, there's a memorial set up to him in Westminster Abbey, one of the few commoners that has a funeral plot in Westminster Abbey. So was the influence recognised by the British people. His health collapsed in his 20s. I told you he entered Parliament when he was 21. It was greatly suspected by doctors that he would not reach the age of 28. He was in such dire health. Then they said he definitely won't make 29, 30, 31, and so on. He lived into his 70s. But numerous times, he was on the brink of death. Toward the end of his life, he was virtually blind. Toward the middle of his life, he couldn't see until about lunchtime. His eyes were so bad. He suffered deterioration of the spine, resulting in one of the first body braces to be invented specifically to him. He, he had a massive curvature of the spine and they invented a brace simply to hold him up so he could walk straight. He was a very short man, very weak man, a very sick man. And this just shows you that not many are noble, not many are wise, not many are mighty according to the world. And God used someone like this to literally change the world. He constantly received death threats. There was a number of assassination attempts made on his life. One assassination pact did result in the Prime Minister being assassinated and William Wilberforce was also a marked man. His children were fools, Many of, some of them were fools, and they got into great debt, which toward the end of his life he accepted responsibility for his children's debt, which saw William Wilberforce made destitute. At the end of his life he owned nothing and he lived in the back room of a rector's house In England. He was constantly made the butt of jokes jokes in the media, which was the newspaper of the day, and he was slandered continually on the streets and in the press. But what was he trying to do? His chief aim was the salvation of everyone. He overlooked doctrinal differences between Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians and Anglicans and, and uh, Quakers and Puritans. He, he, he overlooked all that and said, come on, God is a good God, the devil is a bad devil, this world needs to honour him, can we work together? And they did. He was convinced that all laws should honour God. He knew that only the word of God could change hearts. You see, he stood in Parliament and gave a four-hour speech on why slavery was evil. He had all his research. He showed the, the incredible horrors that were done on the black people of Sierra Leone in the name of British advancement. See, this was the beginning of what's commonly called the Industrial Age, where slave labour 
drove the industrial age machinery. Now, he stood in Parliament, gave a four-hour speech. The London Times says at the end of that speech you could have heard a pin drop. He had won the case. There was no question of it. He won the case in uh, uh, around 1790 or so. Won the case. But, you know, it wasn't for another 30 years that the laws were changed. But it was that day, that speech, that, that he won the case. And they didn't change. And every year after that, he continued to argue to the point where finally, in about, about 1825, a member of parliament by the name of Romilly stood up and he began to say to the parliament what an absolutely disgraceful thing they had done in not honouring William Wilberforce. To the point where William Wilberforce who had gone for so long without any support in the parliament, broke down in tears. And as he broke down in tears and Romilly shared how this man was the only decent man in parliament who had stood up for what would honour God and what would protect all people, and the tears streaming down Wilberforce's face, the whole house stood and applauded. They broke house rules. You're not allowed to applaud in the house. You're only allowed to say, hear, hear. It was reported in the, the papers the next day what had happened in Parliament, and it was shortly after that that the laws did change. In fact, when William Wilberforce <clears throat> retired, he retired disappointed because the laws had not been changed. Finally, he was called out of retirement to just to come and attend an abolitionist meeting. He came... And simply his appearance gave everybody in England such heart and courage that two days after that, the laws were changed. They were enacted a year later, but they were changed two days later. Within about three or four days, Wilberforce died. He died seeing what he had fought for for so long. He died seeing England totally turned around for Christ. He died seeing the city of London one to Jesus, influencing the world. You see, what happened when he did that? He ushered in what's called the Victorian era. Now, you'll hear people who aren't Christians talk down about the Victorian era. Oh, we don't want to go back to the Victorian era. Oh, well, God forbid, you know. The Victorian era where people are nice to each other, people don't steal from each other, people are kind to each other, people attend church, people are nice to women, people are nice to children, people are nice to animals, people are nice to each other. Oh boy, we'd want to go back to that now, would we? Good grief. He ushered in what's called the Victorian era. Why? Because he set the scene ready for Queen Victoria, a Christian queen. That was a novel idea. He set about a worldwide movement to abolish slavery. He showed how governments... Should always legisl uh, will always legislate morality. Governments who say we're not interested in morality are talking with a forked tongue. Because you always legislate morality. He, he's had statues, institutes, universities and societies named after his honour. He was a great man. He was, he, he was absolutely dedicated to seeing souls won to Christ. He realised the need for Christians to work together. He spread the influence of Christ. He preached in churches. He wasn't a preacher, but he did it. He wrote a lot. He, he founded schools and he got involved in training. 1 Timothy 1.15, as we bring this to a close, sums up how William Wilberforce estimated his own life. He did not see himself as a great man. Far from it. This saying is trustworthy and deserves complete acceptance. To this world, Christ Jesus came. Sinful people to reclaim. I am the worst of them. He understood his real condition before God. Do you? Romans 12.1 tells us, I urge you, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices to him, because this is your reasonable service of worship. Would you please stand? Maybe you're here today. And you know that your life is not honouring to God. Maybe you've thought one day. Maybe you've thought, well, 
being religious is just isn't for me. Listen, I'm not talking about being religious. I'm talking about honoring your creator. I'm talking about honoring the one who put breath into your lungs. I don't care whether you feel like it, you want to, you have to, you should, because he deserves it. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray for everyone here today that we will choose to honour Christ. And if there be any here today that have never come into that wondrous, joyful, exciting experience of knowing Christ as Lord and Saviour, Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you've done for us. And we pray that you would just reveal yourself to everyone within the sound of my voice now, that they too may come into this wonderful, exciting peace, this joy that we now have because we know you. Lord, I pray that the things I've shared about William Wilberforce would stir and inspire and cultivate a generation of heroes today because God knows we need them. Father... Forgive us for our apathy. Forgive us for our laziness. Forgive us for our wanton excess lives. Lord, we want to pay the price and live a life that will change a generation for Christ. In Jesus' name.